in a place not overly frequented by men. And the abbot chosen for the place was a certain monk who was a most holy man in everything except where women were concerned. In this regard, he knew how to proceed so cautiously that no one knew about it or even suspected him of it. And so he was considered a most holy and, in, and just in every respect. Now it happened that the abbot was on very good terms with a wealthy peasant named Perondo, an extremely crude and coarse man whose acquaintance pleased the abbot of, if for no other reason than the amusement he sometimes received from the silly things he, that he did. And in associating with him, the abbot noticed that Ferondo had a, a most beautiful lady as his wife, and he fell so passionately in love with her that he could think of nothing else day or night. But when he realized that no matter how simple-minded or witless Ferondo might be in other matters, in loving this wife of his and in keeping a close eye on her, he was most clever, and the abbot was almost driven to despair. As we see it today, and he was so shrewd, he got around Ferrando in such a way as to persuade him to come with him, with his lady, from time to time to amuse himself in the garden of the abbey. And there, the abbot spoke humbly with him about the blessedness of eternal life and of those holiest of deeds performed by many men and women from the past. And the lady was so moved by all this that she wished to go with him as her, go to him as her confessor. And when she asked Ferrando's permission to do so, she received it. The lady then, about to the abbot's great delight, came to make her confession, but before beginning, sitting at his feet, she stated, Sir, if God had given me a real husband, or even none at all, perhaps with your guidance it would have been easier to enter the road you were telling us about that leads others to eternal life. But considering the kind of person Toronto is, and his stupidity, I might as well call myself a man. And yet I am yeah, I got one. You already gave me one. Inasmuch as well he is alive, I can have no other you don't know what it was. Except this crazy man. You don't know what it was. There's no cause whatsoever is unreasonably did, jealous of me that my life with him is nothing so but trouble and tribulation. <laughs> and so, before I go on with my confession, even my I beg you in all humanity to be so kind as to give me some advice on this matter. For if this is not the basis of any attempt on my part to live a better life, then my confession or other good deeds will do me little good. Her speech filled the abbot's heart with great pleasure. For now it seemed that fortune had opened a way to his greatest wish, and he replied, My daughter, I believe it must be a great nuisance for such a beautiful and delicate lady as yourself to have an imbecile for a husband. But it is much worse. It seems to me to have one who is so jealous, therefore, since you have both one and the other, I can easily believe what you say about your suffering. But to be brief about it, the only advice or remedy I can give you is this, that Ferrando must be cured of his jealousy. I know quite well how to prepare the medicine to cure him, provided that you are capable of keeping secret what I am about to tell you. The lady said, Father, don't worry about that. For I would sooner die than tell anyone anything that you told me not to tell anyone else. But how can this be done? The abbot replied, If you wish him to be cured, he will of necessity have to go to purgatory. And how can he go there, inquired the lady, if he is still alive? The abbot answered, He has to die, and then he will go there. And when he has suffered enough punishment to be chastised for his jealousy, we shall, with certain orations, pray to God that he may be returned to life, and he will see to it. Must I then remain a widow? Asked the lady. Yes, replied the abbot. For a certain length of time during which you should be very careful not to allow yourself to remarry anyone else. For God would take that rather badly, and when Ferrando returned, you would have to go back to him, and he would even be more jealous than before. Doing the lady said, so long as he is cured of his horrible says. jealousy of his, right. I cannot stand this and eternal prison. And it's fine with me. Do what you please. What says, then the abbot says, I shall do so. But what reward should I receive for such a service? Father, said the lady, whatever you please, provided that it is in my power. But what can a poor woman like me offer as a suitable gift to a man such as you? To this the abbot replied, my lady, you can do as much for me as I'm about to do for you. That is, since I'm willing to do something for your own good and consolation, so you too should do something for the freedom and salvation of my life. Then the lady asked, 
If that is the case, I am ready to do so. Well then, said the abbot, grant me your love and allow me to enjoy you, for I am burning all over. I am consumed with love for you. What a document the lady, means, amazed to hear these the words, replied, Alas, Father, what no is it that you document. ask of me? The I thought you were a saint. Is it now proper for holy men to request such no, things of women who come to them for advice? Just look at grammar, to this, the abbot said, just by looking at do grammar, not I know be surprised, my sweet one, not how for this in no work. way diminishes my holiness, since holiness resides in the soul, and what I am asking of you is a sin of the body. But in any case, your appealing beauty is so powerful that love compels me to act this way, to tell you that when you consider that your beauty pleases even the saints who are accustomed to gazing at upon the beauties of heaven, you have more reason to be proud of it than any other lady. Furthermore, though I am an abbot, I am a man like other men. As you can see, I am not yet old. It will not be hard for you to do. On the contrary, you should welcome it. For while put on you in purgatory, I will keep you company during the night and provide you with the kind of consolation that he should be giving you. When I'm Nor will Macedonia, anyone ever find out about it, Ephesus, for they all think that I am a saint, and even holier than no what doctrine. you yourself thought a moment ago. Do not reject the grace God sends you, the for there are many women who yearn for what you have, and if you wisely accept my advice, you will have it. Moreover, I own some beautiful and precious jewels, which I do not intend to belong to anyone but you. Therefore, my sweet hope, do for me what I most happily am doing for you. The lady lowered her head, for she did not know how to refuse him, nor did she think that giving in to him was the proper thing to do. In the meantime, the abbot, who realized that she had listened to him and was hesitating over her Teach it's a believing that he had already yeah. had converted her, he went on to add to his God. first <laughs> argument many other words, and by the time he finished talking, he had managed to put the idea into her head that it was all right to do what he said, and so she, with a blush on her face, announced that she was prepared you know, to follow all his every command, they can't follow but that she could do nothing until Fernando had gone to purgatory. So to this, the abbot, happy as could be, replied, we shall see to it that he goes to go there immediately. Thing about Make sure that, that he comes here tomorrow or the day afterwards. Actually to visit. Deal with what was after saying this, he slipped a very large, beautiful ring into her hand and sent her off. The lady, delighted by the gift as well as by the expectation of receiving more, returned to her lady friends and began telling them of the marvelous accounts of the abbot's holiness as they walked home together. A few days later, Fernando went to the abbey. As soon as the abbot caught sight of him, he decided to send him off to purgatory. He had in his possession a powder of marvelous strength, which had been given him by a great prince of the East, who maintained that it was used by the old man of the mountains whenever he wanted to put someone to sleep and send him to paradise, and then bring him back again, and that according to the quantity of the dosage, the person who took it should sleep for a greater or lesser time without hurting himself. Now, and that while it's strength lasted, no one would you, ever you believe the person you want to still be alive. Then, but without letting Fernando see what he was doing, the abbot measured out enough of the powder to induce sleep for three right. days, and put well, it in a glass of rather cloudy wine, and gave it to him to drink while they were still in his cell. Then he took him into the cloister, where he and his monks began to amuse themselves at the expense of Fernando's foolishness. But it was not long before the powder started to work, and all of a sudden such a powerful sensation of drowsiness stuck Fernando's head that he started to doze off on his feet and collapsed fast asleep. The abbot, pretending to be upset over the accident, had Fernando's clothing unfastened, set for cold water, and had it tossed it on his face, and then ordered many other remedies of his to be administered, as if he were wished to restore the life and healing of which had been taken away from him by his attack of stomach gas or whatever else he was But when the abbot and his monks saw that for all their efforts, Fernando was not responding, and on taking his pulse and finding there was no cure, they all agreed that for certain, he was dead. Avoid those so they sent word to his wife and relatives, and all of them came How rushing into the place. And, and after his wife and relatives had wept for a while, the abbot had him placed in a tomb dressed in the clothes he was wearing at the time. The lady returned home, and she asserted the little, reassured the little son whom she had by Ferrando that she would never abandon him. Thus, she remained in Ferrando's house, caring for the son and 